And I said, uh, I said, ma'am, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't understand what I'm looking at. And next she looks at me and she says, this is cancer. And I'm like, what? And she said, this is, uh, and it's metastatic. And there's no cure. You know, so, so Jackie, my wife and I have been married for 19 years. Our 20th anniversary will be next summer, August 31st. We're getting ready to come up on our 19th. It's easy for me to remember because Brandon will be graduating high school. Um, and where we are in our life, she's 51 years old. I'm 45. She's six and a half years older than I am. And when we got married, you know, she was everything that changed my life. And, uh, you know, if you meet her, she's an introvert, but she has this ability to make this, you know, this natural innate ability to make a connection with anybody. Um, she's always been loving with kids. She's always had this kind heart. She's always thinking about somebody else. Um, it doesn't matter if we're sitting at the dinner table. She's always, you know, wondering if they have the right utensils. Do they have all the condiments they need? You know, they're asking about their day and she never asks for anything in return. You know, what I say about my wife is that she's my greatest find, you know, and I tell my, uh, I tell people that my, my kids are my greatest accomplishment. So, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I just changed out a brigade command and two, two striker brigade. And you know, this Nick, um, and a team that I, I love and, it's a very special place. And as we were kind of going through the change in this transition and me moving over to another uh, great organization, uh, Fifth Security Forces Assistance Brigade, the 30 June was the time that we changed out. And, you know, for Jackie, you know, over the last couple of months and really at the end of March and the beginning of April, she started to to communicate to me and let me know that she started to feel incredibly fatigued. And she just really thought it was, you know, after everybody has reacted um, a little bit different, you know, receiving their COVAC shot, she thought it was just something like that. Or maybe it was seasonal. And, you know, as we're getting right back into our routine of working out, she just needed to get back into the gym and she just needed to get back into eating healthy. But it just, things started to get very interesting because it seemed like she just continued to become more and more fatigued. And the other thing that was, was really, really weird is that she started to end up having these really, really bad night sweats. And so, you know, really at the, at the time frame at the, you know, mid-April, end of May, you know, into the, that time, I said, well, hey, you know, like, let's, let's go, Let, let's Let's go to the doctor and figure out what's going on. And the thing that started to really concern me is, you know, she went to the doctor and she got her labs and, you know, just like anything else. And then what I've explained to people is, you know, when you go there, you know, when you end up working with a family practitioner, practitioner, family medicine, pediatrics, they're really trying to based on what they're hearing from their patient and what they see from the lab works. And as they're going through with their experience, they're trying to identify, you know, what's, what's the challenge and what's the root cause. And if there's something else, so if you picture like, you know, they're, they are the hub and they are trying to analyze and trying to determine what is the issue and the concern and, you know, lab work helps them figure that out. Symptoms from talking to the patient helps them figure it out. And we were going through this process for probably about three or four weeks and Jackie's symptoms continue to get worse. And what really, really bothered me was she was so incredibly tired, Nick. I mean, she would wake up in a pool of sweat um, and still feel incredibly embarrassed. And I would tell her, I'm like, hey, you know, like, don't worry about it. Um, she would, and, and, you know, she would get up, she would go to take a shower. 
And as she would come back, um, she would, uh, she would just be completely out of breath. She couldn't do anything. You know, she was walking up and down the stairs and she would be exhausted. She couldn't do anything else. So now we have this loss of breath. We have, you know, she's incredibly fatigued and she's going to the doctor and we're doing these labs and we're trying to find out, we find out her ferritin levels are high. She's getting really, really low on iron. Um, and, and we're just trying to figure out why does she have this shortness of breath? Why does she, why is she anemic and why is she having these night sweats? And as we're going through this, you know, she, uh, she ends up getting its PCS season. So, you know, there's a transition of, of, of personnel. She gets a new family um, medicine doctor who's great, who's trying to really figure out what's going on. I'm changing out of brigade command from 2-2 striker brigade on 4 Jane, right? I'm changing into command in 5th Security Forces Assistance Brigade on 30 June. Jackie's having all these symptoms, the most concerning, shortness of breath. She's anemic, which we know from several lab reports. And she's having these night sweats. She had been to the doctor beforehand and the doctor ordered some additional labs and didn't really know what it was. So this next time I went with her to go see her provider on 13 June. And on 13 June, we sat down um, and we went through and I ended up being the advocate for her and taking all the notes because she was, she was having such a difficult time speaking and having a conversation and describing the symptoms and all the things that she was going through. So I said, I said, listen, you know, we've been documenting this, you know, for a while, here's the, here's the, the issue with night sweats. Here's the back pain. Here's the hip pain she's having. She can't walk up the stairs and, and she's incredibly anemic. And, uh, the provider comes in and goes, I want to run some more labs. I don't want to do the following things yet, meaning like a, an iron infusion. And I had, you know, my sister, who's a, you know, family practice doctor. I had, you know, I asked Dave Yoon, who was a surgeon to, to continue to look at the labs and help me prepare myself when I sat down and engaged with these doctors um, about what, what I needed to do to voice and be the advocate for my wife. And he comes in and he says, hey, uh, I think that we have to do this additional testing to determine whether or not your wife has multiple myeloma. And I was like, I, what, what is that? And I could tell, you know, in his mind, he was the first person that had identified that there was something wrong or these symptoms did not add up to just like an infection or some yeah. other concern. And, you know, we thought it might've been her thyroid. We might've thought it wasn't something else, but he's the first person that identified something was not right. So really a blessing, you know, at that time. And then I sat there and I, uh, I'm Googling and I realized multiple myeloma is a blood cancer. And of course, right. You know, this hits me. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a week and a half away from command. We're right at the beginning of getting ready to take, you know, some block leave and spend some time together. And we're just like crushed. And uh, I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll do these tests. We'll find out what we need to do. And then we'll, we'll, get, we'll get forth on this and we'll, we'll move on. So I take my wife to, the, to Seattle and we'd set up a, basically like a week and a half uh, worth of trips where we're going to stay all over in the city. And everything that we wanted to do, we had to dial it back. And, and it was really just, hey, get an opportunity, stay in a real nice place go eat a meal. And that was about it. That's, that's all she could do based on her current condition. And the, the other thing that this, this family care or family uh, practice doctor uh, did that I really appreciate, right. And this goes back to what I talk about, you know, tacit knowledge is yeah. he goes, I think we need to, I want to put in a referral to do the following things, you know, an endoscopy an ultrasound, you know, so he started going through all the things to help narrow down what this problem set was because these symptoms had manifested and, and continued to come to surface. And he was trying to do everything he could. And he says, I also think that we need to end up doing a referral to a hematologist. And so, okay. And so, you know, we see hematologists is always somebody that, that focuses and, and works with, you know, blood, but it's a hematologist slash oncologist, somebody that also focuses on cancer. And just in the, in the, in the current, hospital where we're, where we're stationed at, 
you know, th there is not a lot of hematologists and a lot of times they have the only, they only have the ability to, to work with active duty and, and retirees. And so their patient load is, is very limiting. So, you know, when they can't do that, they make a referral off post. Mm -hmm. And over that, since that time of 13 June, about 10 days later, Jackie's symptoms are getting significantly worse to the point where at one time she woke up and, you know, I thought that she was having dry heaves and I, and I stood up and I went to the bathroom and I said, are you okay? And she wasn't dry heaving. She was trying to catch her breath. I almost oh. called, I almost called 911 um, until she, she ended up catching her breath. So then I, then I was starting to get really, really concerned. And, uh, and I said, and I was telling myself, you know what, you know, we're, we're going to go see this hematologist. We're going to figure this thing out. And, and my wife's going to be, you know, we're going to, we're going to do what we need to do. And my wife's going to be okay. And she's going to go back to the, the way she is. And that's, that's the way we both were. You know, she's like, I just want to see this hematologist. I, I want to get iron infusions or whatever they needs to do. And I'm ready to get back after life. And then she calls me one day at work and she's bawling. She's pretty upset. And I said, uh, what, what, what's going on? And meanwhile, right, I'm, I'm transitioning into my new job. And she says, I'm going to die in 30 days. And uh, I'm not even getting the chance to see a hematologist. I said, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? And she says, the referral they gave me is for a hematologist that is not even available for the next month. And I said, okay, hang on, hang on. So I made some calls um, and uh, it was great that the, you know, the commander of the hospital also got engaged with me. And I said, listen, you know, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be incredibly rude, you know, um, but I, I wouldn't allow this for a soldier or a soldier's family member. You know, I, and I said, I need to be able to see my primary care doctor again for my wife and let her know, let him know that my wife's symptoms have gotten significantly worse. And because they've gotten significantly worse, he's the one that understands this current situation that I'm going on. So again, we're blessed with this, this family practice doctor. He runs, he goes to see the hematologist that's currently at the hospital that we're at. Um, he explains the situation. They work through a bunch of things, you know, and they go, okay, hematologist says that, that she wants to pick up your case. She wants to see you. She wants to order an additional set of labs. So I, this is the 29th of June, the day before I'm changing into this new command position. And I tell Brandon, my son, Hey, I want you to take your mom to the hospital. So she can get some labs drawn. So she draws the labs and, and then Nick within, you know, about an hour and a half, her doctor calls me. And he says, hey, you need to take your wife to the emergency room. And I said, for what? He goes, she needs a blood transfusion. Her hemoglobin rates or levels had consistently decreased. And now they were below seven. She had these symptoms. She needs a blood transfusion. I'm like, what? So I, you know, it's the end of the day. I, I'm, I take my wife and of course, here, here's, here's the love of my life again. Like, hey, do we, do we really need to go? We could probably go later this weekend. Let's go after your change of command. I'm like, no. You know, we get her in the car. We go to the emergency room. Again, this doctor had already talked to the ER staff. He'd already talked to inpatient. He'd already talked to hematology. So he was doing everything it was, right? The hub, talking to all the spokes. And uh, we get there, and right away, they pull us in. The hospital was already full, so they couldn't move her up to inpatient into, an, into a room. But it actually ended up being a blessing in disguise because if, if she had been moved into a room, visitor hours end at about 8, 30, 9 o'clock. And unless there's certain special circumstances, I wouldn't have been able to stay with her. So I stayed with her in a room that they had set aside in the ER. And again, another you know, great doctor, which I didn't know at the time, you know, this, this, uh, this captain came in and he was just like a professional. The way he spoke, you know, his bedside manner. And he said, okay, I, I, he listened to me. He went through the, and I went through the entire history, all the symptoms because my wife was in an incredible amount of pain. So, you know, we talking now for me, it was night sweats, you know, it was the anemia, it was a loss of breath. Um, and, and it just, she was so incredibly weak, but 
you know, in the back of my mind, I knew that her back was sore. I knew that her hips were sore, but to me that those were the other things that were more important at that time. But, you know, I had to make sure I had a laundry list of all these things, these symptoms that she had. And so the, this, this doctor looked at me and goes, Hey, I, I recommend that we take labs. We, uh, we give you a blood transfusion, which they had to screen her again. You know, the poor thing she had, she's had so many IVs in her, in her arms over these past two weeks. And, uh, she turns around and she ends up, she ends up uh, getting a blood transfusion. And then he comes in and he says, Hey, I recommend we need to do a CT scan, head, chest, pelvis. And uh, you know, my, my wife's like, you know, do, do we really need to do this? Do we, you know? And I said, yeah, we, we need to do this. Right. And uh, she's telling people as they're coming in, she says, you know, my husband's got a, a ceremony. He's changing into command. And even one of the night nurses, you know, that comes in, he said, yeah, I, I, I stopped and I looked up and I said, wow, he goes, this is, it's, this is Colonel Chung. And my wife, the entire time, right. She's completely disregarding anything about herself. She's like, yeah, you know, my husband. And he's like, yeah, I, I follow the Lancer Brigade Instagram page. And so when I realized you guys were in here, I was like, wow. And, and, you know, my wife, the entire time, all she's doing is talking about like, you know, my husband's going to be tired tomorrow. He's, I said, babe, do not worry about any of that stuff. And so the poor thing had to drink three hours of contrast, right? So you, you drink this solution, you have to wait an hour, you drink another hour worth of solution. And so they, it's all part of the prep, right? It goes through the CT scan. We finally do the CT scan probably about 10, 10 30 at night. Um, and then we, we wait for the results. You know, and, and in everything that you talk about and, and that I've mentioned to you, I think the hardest part is, not knowing, right? You get tested with a whole nother level of patience. Cause in my mind, I'm like, okay, let's go. Let's work the problem. You know, like, Hey, let's bring in the, the, the radiologist, whoever's on call. Let's read this thing. Let's go with it. Let's, let's do what I need to do. Get my wife, whatever she needs. And we're going, she started to look a little bit better after having, you know, the blood transfusion, which was a great sign. So I started thinking, all right, we're, we're good here. We're good. All is, all is straight. And then the, the roller coaster of emotions start coming in. People that are you know, well-intentioned and want to help, they come in and they provide you what they think is good news or, or news just in general. You know, someone comes in and goes, hey, you know, I just talked to the radiologist and it doesn't look like there's any abnormalities or any, you know, a, there's acute, you know, or not acute or abnormalities on the, on the imagery. I'm like, okay, that's great, right? Somebody else comes in and goes, hey, you know, they think they found something, um, but, uh, you know, we're waiting for the official results of the radiologist, which we should have in a couple hours. And now I'm like, well, okay, well, what does that mean? And then another, another doctor comes in and he goes, Hey, do you guys know what we're dealing with here? I was like, no idea. And he's like, um, what have you been told? I said, I'm looking at my phone. I said, well, we were just told by a previous doctor, you know, on the imagery, no abnormalities, this, that, whatever. And he goes, no, that's not true. He goes, uh, they think they found some, th some things. And he mentioned a little bit on her, uh, on her kidney. And then after that, the, he said, and, uh, it, and it could be, could be cancerous. So then I'm like, I'm like, what? And so, you know, we're waiting for the official, you know, results. I have to tag out with my daughter. My daughter comes into the emergency room. She stays there. We tag out probably about 4 30, 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm writing, I'm writing this, this speech for the ceremony, you know, um, on the side of her bed. And again, my wife is so worried about me. And and she's just not even focusing on herself. And I keep telling her, this is, it doesn't matter. This pales, you know, in comparison to what you're going through. So, you know, we go to the ceremony the next day. My brother had flown in, my sister-in-law, my three nephews. I bring Brandon and my two grandkids, Kiana and Joshua, with me to the ceremony. And, of course, because Jackie has been there at everything that I've ever been a part of to experience uh, in the military. It, it's clear, right? Everybody that knows us knows her. Is, and when they see me, they're, they're asking where she is, you know, up front. And I tell her, oh, you know, she's, she's in the hospital, you know, she's, she's had some symptoms and stuff and she had to get a blood transfusion, but you know, we're working through all that. I get a phone call right before the ceremony and uh, the doctor, it's her, her doctor. And he goes, Hey, I, I just got the results of this. 
he goes, when can you come back to the hospital? And I said, well, I, I'm, I've got to do this, this ceremony. And then I will be back at the hospital as soon as I can. He says, okay. Um, he goes, cause I just got the results back. There, there are some nodules in her lungs. There are two masses on her kidneys. And then there is something on her L5 lumbar, which is the vertebrae right above her tailbone. And I'm like, you know, in my, in my heart, I'm like, I'm crushed, right? And here's my 17 year old son. I had to walk across the street from the parade field. I'm sitting there and I'm, uh, I'm on the phone and I'm, I'm trying to put on this, this brave face. And, uh, and I see all these people that have come to see me, you know, hardened, you know, Ranger, non-commissioned officers, friends, guys from the, you know, the previous teams I've served with. And all I can think about is my wife. But I know at this moment, you know, I'm, I'm really asking her for the strength because I know that everything that she's going through, it's, it's, it's harder than what I'm, I'm about to experience. So we go through the ceremony. We knock the ceremony out. Probably one of the toughest, you know, um, speeches to give publicly, you know, when your mind is focused on a loved one, especially when you're mentioning them. Then. And then, you know, I go back to the hospital. She's in the emergency room. We're transitioned up to the, up to the uh, uh, inpatient. And while she's up in the inpatient, you know, the hematologist now had, had wanted to order uh, an MRI on her back. And, you know, while we're there and where she was inpatient for, you know, she came in on the 29th and we ended up getting discharged on the 2nd of July. While we were there, she got two blood transfusions and iron infusion. She did two MRIs. They did a biopsy of her lower back and they ended up doing a bone marrow biopsy and they did a biopsy of her bone, of her hip. And, you know, the, the entire time we're there, right? I, I'm going back and, and my wife had, had, uh, had, had uh, two MRIs. And the entire time, you know, my wife is looking better and better. You know, she's getting color back in her face. She's getting a little bit more energy. She still has got this, this sweating going on, but I'm like, you know, she's, she's coming back around. She's obviously sore because she just went through these biopsies. And then we end up, uh, the, the hematologist um, asks us to come down to her office so she can review the imagery. She can review the CT scan of what she saw. She can review the MRI that she had ordered for her lower back. And then she reviews the MRI for the rest of her spine. And so we go down there, right? I have no idea what I'm about to experience. I'm sitting there and I, I, uh, I'm like, okay. And I, as soon as I walk in, right, I have this, this like wicked flashback. And I don't really tell many people, but you know, when I was in the army war college, I was diagnosed with malt lymphoma with cancer. I didn't know really what it was. I didn't really know, um, what stages, you know, kind of meant, but it was really, it was stage one malt lymphoma and it was found incidentally when I was going through an endoscopy, my doc had saw something on the way out and said, Hey, what is that? Grabbed it, went to do a, uh, a biopsy of it. And, uh, he came back and he called me and he said, Hey, um, this biopsy came back and I'm sorry, this, uh, this sample came back that we took of your stomach lining and it's uh, positive for malt lymphoma. And I, I said, I, I don't really know what that means. He goes, there's a, I need you to, to come back in and we need to start running these rounds of tests, ultrasound, you know, PET scan, all these things. And it wasn't until I sat down and I was uh, about to get the contrast, you know, placed in an IV to prep me for this PET scan that I had this guy who had like the bedside manner of a ranger squad litter. He goes, okay, so uh, we found cancer in you. He goes, and this is going to go through your entire body to light up everywhere else there's cancer. So we know how to attack it and get on the way to treatment. And, and then, you know, you're like, you're like cancer. Like what? I'm like, my doc never talked about cancer. He talked about malt lymphoma. And uh, so then it kind of hit me a little bit. And uh, I went through this journey. I went through the, you know, see oncologist, radiation oncologist. I went to a special, special, uh, specialty doc that works with lymphomas out in Hershey Park in Pennsylvania, all were great positive experience. And uh, he made a decision, right? Not to do radiation oncology, to put me and treat me like I had, you know, this virus. 
um, that I didn't test positive for and have the same doc go through this endoscopy. And, and it was, it was clear there was nothing else in my body. So you talk about, you know, luck, you talk about being blessed. You talk about, you know, you, you like winning the lottery, you know, my, my wife, the entire time she's having this incredible, you know, this nervousness as she's watching, you know, and, and I, I keep telling her, I said, this is going to be fine. I'm like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to kill this thing. I'm going to beat it with bourbon and hate, you know, and we're almost out of bourbon. And I didn't really have an appreciation of what she was going through, you know, at that time. And so now I go back after this flashback, back to this room with the oncologist and I'm sitting down and uh, she starts showing us these imagery pictures. And she says, you know, this is what the CT scan showed. And it was a very, it was a, it was almost like super white uh, glowing on her L5. So she said, I, I asked to do the MRI of her lower back. And uh, this, this same area, even though we found it on the CT scan, here's the cells surrounding it that are very similar to what you're seeing in the L5 and other places up her lower back. So then we asked to do the MRI for the rest of the you know, spine. And there's places that go all the way up through to the base of her neck. And I said, uh, I said, ma'am, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't understand what I'm looking at. And next she looks at me and she says, this is cancer. And I'm like, what? And she said, this is, uh, and it's metastatic. And there's no cure. And then right there is probably, you know, I've said I've had some crucible moments and some tough times, but right there was probably one of the toughest. And uh, I look over and there's my wife, super stoic, right? She's like, okay, uh, what does this mean? What can I tell my family? And I'm not doing too well. And, uh, you know, I don't, uh, I don't ever cry. You know, I, I used to tell my son that I had my, uh, my tear ducts removed when I was 12. And uh, I started on this journey of having emotions about things that uh, I've had to wrap my heads around over the last two weeks. And uh, I asked her, hey, can you, uh, can you talk to my kids? And that was probably, I think, even harder at some points, right? Where you go, hey, uh, bring a 17-year-old kid in. And you go, hey, man, what you're about to experience is going to be the hardest news you've ever heard in your life. And I'm sorry that, uh, that you're going to have to hear it when you're 17. And he took it hard. He took it hard. Um, but he, he, he was a champ. My daughter, I mean, I see both of them and how they, uh, the emotion on their faces and, and it was difficult. And, uh, you know, at that moment in time, see the pain in their faces. You know, we, we train for a lot of things and I think at that moment, that's where I went back to compartmentalizing everything, you know, um, being the one to tell them, hey, we're going to be okay. We've got a great doctor. We're walking through this. And uh, it was tough. And then the worst part about it was, you know, the, the, the doc looked at me and she said, hey, all I can tell you your wife has cancer in her bones, but this is not a bone cancer. This is, uh, I can tell you for sure, it's not a blood cancer either. It's not a multiple myeloma. It is not leukemia. It is not, you know, some type of lymphoma. She's, she said, it's either one of three things. It could be a melanoma. So, you know, something with the skin. 
it could be a uh, sarcoma, like connective tissue, muscle. She said, or it could be a carcinoma, like uh, it is originating in, in some other organ, larger gland. So to July, you know, completely changes my world. Finding out that, you know, the love of my life has stage four metastatic cancer and there's no cure. And so we could start on this journey and, you know, where we're at at this point, you know, she has gone through another biopsy um, of her kidney uh, and, and where they think it is. They did the, the, the first round of biopsy came back and the stain showed that it could be breast or it could be kidney. And so she did the, our, our doc wanted to make sure to do the kidney because the way you treat those two things are, are two very different ways. And she wanted to, you know, order a, a PET scan. And I've never been so nervous in my life, you know, cause I go back to my PET scan and, and thinking everything was fine. And uh, again, you know, you walk into the hospital, I get the results of the PET scan and it's not just in her spine, it's in her hips, it's in her legs, it's in her shoulders. It's, uh, it's, it's, this disease is, is all in her, in her skeleton, you know? Um, again, you know, I feel this like wave of, you know, just crushing and, uh, my wife just super stoic. Okay. What do we need to do? What, what's the way forward? And so the doc is incredibly open and transparent. She shares exactly how she's looking at this problem set and how it gets to the point of, you know, I want to very, I want to verify because I believe what we're dealing with is your kidney and based on the radioisotope and, you know, how it responded in the PET scan, but I want to confirm. So they did a biopsy and they, we did that this past week and it was, uh, they took four good samples and we have an appointment with her tomorrow and they did an MRI of her brain. Her brain looks good. Um, there is a little bit of disease, but there's barely, barely in her skull. So the good thing is, is that the rest of her organs um, look pretty good. It's just her, you know, it's in her, it's in her bones. Yeah. And you know, what I try to explain to people as you're going through this experience, right, is, you know, people, people know people that have cancer, whether it's, you know, something, you know, in their, in their, in their personal lives, or, you know, they, they heard somebody, but you don't ever hear stories of people that are healthy. You know, you don't ever hear of, you know, somebody that's, you know, 51 years old that, you know, does high intensity training workouts that eats healthy and all of a sudden has these onslaught of symptoms. But, you know, when I'm, I'm looking at this and I, uh, the doctor, I said, how, how long do you think she's had this? And she said, well, in my estimation, it's been at least nine months. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And she's, she couldn't believe my wife never came in about any pain management, you know? And she said, you must be in a, an incredible amount of pain. And, and Jackie just said, I just thought, you know, the pain in my hips or the pain in my back was because I was getting older. It was just a tough workout in the gym. And Nick, I'm telling you, I'm looking over my back constantly hurts my shoulders, you know, my neck. And I have a whole new respect for pain level and strength. You know, I'm a big baby when it comes to that stuff. I got a hangnail, you know, I, you know, something I can't sleep right. I'm, I'm, I'm crying to my doc about something. And my wife's over here just battling through it like, like there's nothing. And so, you know, we hope that uh, this next meeting that we have tomorrow where we're at right now is this will be our, our next appointment with our hematologist oncologist. And she's great. She's incredibly personable. She, she, you know, she, I told her the other day that we were blessed that she was in my life and, and that she was, you know, taking my wife on as a cancer patient. She says, your wife's not a patient. She's like, your wife's a person and uh, that has a story. And she just happens to have cancer as part of that. And, and I'm blessed to be part of her life, to be part of this story. And, uh, you know, I heard something the other day, I was listening to it. And then, you know, a lot of times when you hear something like this, 
you can use that story to, to build a wall around you, you know, to lock yourself in a tower. Or you can use your story and uh, as fuel and to be open and transparent and, and share, you know, what it's all about. And so, you know, where we're at now is hopefully after all this, this, uh, this testing, we'll find out that, uh, that the kidney is the one that is the prime source of that's leading to all this disease that it's spread throughout our body. And when people think right of, of cancer, right, they think of a tumor, they think of cancerous cells and that they potentially break off. And that's where these stages come from. You know, when they break off and they travel through the bloodstream, they pass through, you know, and they attach to other, other locations. Um, and, and, then, and then tumors start to form. But in my wife's case, it, it's, it's almost the exact opposite. These cancer cells, they end up attaching to her bones, but they're not, you know, forming these masses. They're almost like eating away. So, you know, I, what I share with people when I try to explain it, it's, it's like termites that are kind of, you know, eating at the foundation of the, of the house. And you got to manage, as, as the doc says, you know, the pain management, stop and control the disease. Um, uh, through, through different, different, you know, approaches and then be able to work the primary source at the same time. The good thing is, you know, that there's a, uh, people think, you know, when you have cancer, that it's, uh, chemo is the, is the number one thing you might heard of radiation, but you know, the way that if, if this is kidney cancer, um, which, which our doc believes that this is the case, um, that there are different avenues to, to treat it. One of them is this thing called immunotherapy, which uh, is, is, is relatively new. And it was available, you know, not until, you know, probably two, three years ago. And there's been a lot of advancement in this stuff where you actually, you take it through some type of uh, pill form or, you know, IV and, and it, uh, it helps the, the uh, patient's own immune system fight off uh, disease. And so, you know, that's, that's currently where we're, where we're at right now. And, you know, the, the, my kids are doing well, you know, um, they took it pretty hard. It was a, it was a, it was a rough 4th of July weekend. Um, and as I looked around, I, I, I was amazed at how tough they were. And I was amazed that if uh, thinking back, if I was 17, if I'd have been able to handle this news the way my son has. And, uh, I started to think that, you know, I was the guy that was, um, probably taking it the worst. And then here comes the roller coaster ride of emotions. You know, I'm angry at the world. How does this happen? Um, you know, how can I do this? Is my wife going to live, you know, to see my son graduate? Is she going to make it through, uh, the time when, you know, I finish this, this next opportunity in the in the military, is she going to see my son graduate from college, see him get married, any of those things? And so your mind goes through all these things and you get angry. And, uh, and I'd say probably about four or five nights, right? I, I'm going to sad by myself, your mind's spinning. Um, everybody's calling, you know, they find out, you know, and um, there's a, there's a close network of people within your network that you can entrust that they know that they will they will be the one to be the storytellers for you right to, to spare you of having to explain this how many different times until you're ready to share yeah. and they did and it's you know and it's so difficult and you know nobody knows how to react when you hear this news you know what do you say do you call do you text and so you know, first thing I, I would say, I'm, I'm, in, I'm incredibly grateful for family, friends, you know, those in the military, those not in the military, um, the organizations that I work with, that I'm currently working, you know, and I have a, have a privilege to be a part of the bosses and the leaders. They have all reached out at some aspect of it, you know, and directed, told me not to worry about things, to take out the the, the rock of stress about having to worry about things to give me the time to spend with my wife, to go through, you know, this process of the diagnosis, the additional testing to find out what it is so we can get on this path of treatment and the way forward. And, you know, I mean, good friends have started, you know, 
a meal train. I didn't even know what that was. Um, because people ask what they can do. And I said, no, you don't need to do anything. I've had, you know, people call that are asking, you know, they want to fly out right now. They they, Hey, we'll clean your house. We'll, you know, we'll mow your lawn. And I'm like, I, I, I appreciate all that. And I, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't need any of that. And, and I know it's tough, right? They just want to show that they care and they're thinking. And, and I always tell them, I said, you know, Hey, I always appreciate, I love that you reached out and uh, any positive thoughts and vibes and prayers, you know, are much appreciated. And so, you know, I'm going through this and, and people are trying to help me. And, you know, it's this, when people help you out, right. The, the, the same person, you know, it's not necessarily the same people that are willing to make a meal and drop it off. And they feel like that's the way they're helping to communicate. They write a message or they send the text um, are not necessarily the same people that, you know, you're going to call, you know, when you know, and you're talking about, you know, death and mortality and being alone. And uh, I had that probably for the first 48, 72 hours. And, um, you know, everybody's telling me to be positive you know, to, to be strong. And, uh, I may be honest, like I, I probably went to sleep, crying myself to sleep, waking up, still crying, you know, my eyes like, you know, like welded shut from, from all the tears that supposedly I was not supposed to have. I did a lot of eye sweating as they say, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, about, about day four or five into this fight, I think we're on day 12 or so. Um, a mentor pulled me aside and he goes, I just need five minutes. He said, come, come sit with me for coffee. And I said, um, okay. I said, uh, I said, what's going on? He says, I don't mean to preach. Um, but I know what you're going through and I know these feelings. He goes, you gotta be the rock for your wife. You gotta be the rock for your family. And I know you're hurting. He said, uh, and he shared with me, he shared with me about some very personal things that had happened. The loss of his, uh, of a spouse to cancer, the loss of a, of a child to diabetes, the loss of a child, you know, to a hunting accident. And it makes you, you know, kind of think about things in perspective um, a lot, what you're grateful, what you're appreciative of. You know, we're comfortable in life not knowing. You know, it'd be incredibly tragic, right? If something ends up happening, there's a fatality of a loved one and, and you have no idea. You didn't get a chance to say goodbye. You didn't appreciate, or you didn't get a chance to, to, to tell your appreciation about something or you forgot or you didn't spend some magical moment. And, uh, you know, after about, you know, three or four days, you know, I'm sitting there and, you know, I'm having all these emotions and angry and I'm, I'm trying to figure out and then I went back and I, I, I paused and after I had a great conversation, you know, with Tim Kite and uh, he said, you know, emotion is our fuel. It fuels us, um, but it should not be what provides us guidance and direction. It should be our servant and not our master. He goes, and this is the event plus response equals outcome. He goes, this is, um, and to have this cathartic discussion with him, uh, knowing that he had just gone through the battle of stage four cancer, you know, and listening to him and having an honest emotional conversation, I stopped and I, and I paused and I said, okay, what is it that I am not doing or that I need to do to help my wife fight this fight? Because I'm not going to sit back and I'm not just going to wait for somebody to give her a pill, to give her an IV, to have her go through some type of radiation or some type of chemo treatment. And so I, I started to pour myself into everything I could, right? Um, metastatic stage four cancer survivors. You know, what did they do? What did they change? And I, I found out, right, I came across this book. It was called Anti-Cancer, Right written by this doctor who actually had cancer himself when he was a med student. He had a brain tumor. Um, and then he realized, he said, you know, when I went to medical school, nobody told us that we all have cancer cells in our body. And 
when you when you read through this book, he realizes there's four things you you should change or you should address that helps you um, fight off these cancerous cells. And by doing these things, you can fight off a good percentage of these cancer cells. And there's other discussion of this. And, and what he wrote about is actually now a practice. Integrative oncology is what it's called. And so he talks about, you know, toxins, you know, minimizing the exposure to toxins. Number two, he talks managing stress, you know, reducing the stress management, which is one of the biggest things that we got to work on with my wife. Exercise, at least 30 minutes, right? Six times a week. And he talks about diet. And so it's interesting that I found this, right? Uh, this doctor that was a cancer survivor after having a brain tumor. And then he talked about, you know, and went through all the, the information in these medical journals, which are so difficult to read and put it in a very easy, easy kind of playbook on what you can do that helps with conventional medicine. Then I came across another doctor you know, from the Mayo Clinic that gave this presentation about integrative on oncology. And she talked about being a stage four, you know, diagnosis of, of metastatic cancer um, while she was in med school, given three months to live. And, and she is now a doctor that's gone through this. And so I started pouring myself into all these things, reading about it. And I said, you know what, I, I, can, I can help my wife do the things that we've talked about, you know, in our own job. How do I build a structure? How do I get everybody on board to help reset the environment to give her a fighting chance? So when she does have treatment, she has the things. And so she does. And this is, this is what I, I, I would share. So, you know, she wakes up in the morning and we all have a routine. And what I'm doing, right, I've said it before, it's not a system unless, you know, it is, it is constantly being tested. It's constantly being evaluated. You know, you put the right people in place. And you're always evaluating and assessing to see if it can be more effective and efficient. And I've had to, I had to bring my family in and rally them. I, I, I need all of your help to do this. I said, if I told my wife that I was going to get out of the military to take care of her, she wouldn't allow it. That would make her more upset. If my son said, I'm not going to go to college because I want to stay home, she wouldn't allow it. The same thing with my daughter or my granddaughter. And I started to, to look and, and realize the things that were going on, we were actually blessed at the timing of all this to happen. You know, my daughter and my grandkids living with us during the time of COVID, you know, if, if, if my wife had been diagnosed, this, diagnosed with this, this disease and she was not with us, then my wife would be so worried about how she would be getting to Texas, right? And taking care of their grandkids. Um, my kids are at an age where they're self-sufficient. My kids are at an age where they can help. You know, my kids are at a, at a thing where they understand about how to give and be more than themselves. You know, even my grandson, 10 year old, you know, Magoo, he knows that what he does every day is part of the larger thing. You know, we should, we would always talk about eating dinner together, but it was always loud and kind of everybody kind of walking back and forth. You know, my grandson sets the table because he knows that's part of the routine that everybody can come in there and relax. So my wife wakes up in the morning, you know, we make breakfast for her. And, and we follow the Mediterranean diet because the Mayo Clinic has tested this, you know, and wow. it is truly, truly helped. And so we've done a lot of reading and kind of studying on this. And this is, we're only two weeks into this. We're not experts by any means, but we recognize there are certain foods there. Are, and, and a lot of it is plant-based, you know, and, and one of these doctors in the presentation had mentioned, he said, Hey, have you ever looked at plants, why they can survive bacteria and famine and, you know, certain things with, uh, you know, animals that are trying to eat, it's because they have these photochemicals that can kind of fight off these things, you know, through weather and all this. They're very good for, you know, cell growth and, and fighting off these, these cancerous cells. And the other thing that I didn't realize is that, you know, we all have some type of cancer cells in our body, but it, they, we do these things on routine and they end up, you know, kind of and, and end up, if you end up living a healthy lifestyle through your diet, you know, exercise, minimizing toxins and, and the stress management, you can fight off those things. So I said, my wife cannot do this alone. So we're all going to do, you know, with her. So she wakes up in the morning, we make her breakfast. She's got a routine, just like we teach, you know, soldiers build the exercise and the meals in there first, right? They become the, the, the left or right limit or the handrail, if you may as we walk through how we're gonna help her go through this. And you plan those things first. And so 
she comes down. The first thing she does after she eats and she eats upstairs because she's not worried about anybody else. She doesn't worry about feeding anybody else. She doesn't worry about anybody else. And it's important. And when she does that, now she comes down and she's ready and she's ready to start the day. And when she's ready to start the day, the first thing she does, we got family in town, right? And they have been able to re-energize a gap that I've had, which is faith. So she prays, you know, and Jackie prays probably about 60 minutes a day. They do prayer and then she goes on a walk. So here's my wife. They couldn't walk up and down the stairs, you know, almost two months ago. And she's walking about a mile and a half, almost two miles wow. a day. Right. And, and she's in pain in, um, but you know, through what we're getting from medication, um, she does this. So breakfast come down, she has prayer fellowship. She goes on a walk. She comes back. She has a morning snack. She's able to do some activities, you know, engagement, um, positive discussion. She has another snack, you know, in the afternoon or lunch, lunch, and then a snack. And she goes on another walk, comes back. And so it's one of the things I didn't mention in part of the symptoms is with all this night sweat, she ended up losing 25 pounds. And by losing 25 pounds right now, I'm like, I got to get her healthy. I got to get her body healthy again, get her back in this routine. And that's what everybody's helping us with kind of go through. It's important to have this structure, but at the same time, it's also, it's not just completing the tasks of the day. You know, it's made everybody relook, you know, Brandon went through a purge and changed everything that we're eating. Um, my, my daughter and my, my sister-in-law have gone through and we planned everything out. They, they bought a juicer, you know, so it's not just minimizing on sugars. It's, it's everything as one portion of it um, in the diet. And it's, it's programming all those things very similar. We have, right. So she's, it's, it's like, she's a, a professional athlete, you know, and, and eating is for the nutrition, uh, nutrition and the nutrients that she needs to get ready to go into the fight. And the fight is, you know, when she's going to end up, you know, using whatever, uh, conventional medical, uh, treatment and approach that they're going to have ready for her to go. And so it's, let's be honest, right. The, uh, if it is kidney cancer, the odds and the percentage and the prognosis is uh, 10 to 13% will survive five years or above. That's, that's what I've read in open source, you know, and um, there's other places that have done some amazing things in clinical trials that have raised that for stage four um, patients to, to 25%. And, and the, the advancements in immunotherapy, which is spread throughout the kidney cancer um, uh, all of the things clearly show, uh, that there is, it, it is, it is already flourished to helping several patients across uh, the world. And so for, for me, you know, when I hear 10 to 13, right. And some people go, wow, that's only 10 to 13% chance. That's 10 out of 13, 10 to 13 people out of a hundred, right. Those are the, uh, the odds. And some people will be like, man, that's, that's, that's pretty drastic. The way I look at it is, you know, Teen Chung has never backed away from any challenge. You know, we, we, we've always had those odds in our life, whether we realize it or not. Um, and so how do you beat it? Number one, you know, my wife is on the young age of the scale. Normally this shows up in about age 55 to 60 in females. Um, my wife's very young still, 51. So she has that at her advantage. She has youth as the advantage. Number two, she already had a healthy lifestyle. She didn't smoke. She didn't drink. She was already used to doing physical activity and had a routine. She was able to go and do that. And number three, she's, she's got an incredible network of support. Um, and she's got faith and she's got these friends. And, you know, I, I tell people, you know, remember I was telling you in the beginning that, that uh, you could have some fatality and, 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 and a person that ends up passing away never gets to see everybody that shows up to their funeral. And, and my wife now, she has gotten to see just in the past 23, 24 years of our lives through dating and being married. It's uh, all these people that she has touched in some way, in some act of kindness, you know, and I don't think about, you know, the, the concern. And it doesn't mean that I'm not sad and it doesn't mean I'm not going to have those days. But I know that for me, it's to be positive, to be the rock, you know, for my family is I have to 
reestablish the environment and some structure to give her the, fi- the best fighting chance that she has when she goes to the battle and she's not going to be alone. And uh, I told you this before, but what I, I tell her is, you know, before she goes to bed, I look at her and I tell her, I'm blessed to have you in my life. And in the morning when she wakes up, I look at her and I say, I'm blessed to have one more day with you. And, uh, you know, I used to think that, you know, I, I tell guys, you know, that every day is date day. And uh, I, learned, I learned that as I was going through early days in marriage, that the same thing that you would do for the person that you're courting, you should do every day something. So I was, you know, the guy that brings flowers home for whatever reason. But uh, what this experience has showed me is that, that I can find, you know, a way to tap in and give more to be better. Um, and, and, and then I'll leave with two things. So I sat there and as she was getting the MRI on her brain and I was reading Admiral Mulcraven's uh, hero code. And the first chapter is about courage. And, you know, it's really a book about, you know, everybody wants to, if if you look to around at the, at the people that have these virtues and you, you listen to their stories and how they, they, uh, they, they became the way they are, you can learn from them and you can use them as the seeds in your own life, um, you know, to, to strengthen your foundation of character. And so the first portion, you know, in the hero code, he says, number one, I will always strive to be courageous, to take one step forward as I confront my fears. And in the first chapter, he talks about courage. He starts off with a quote that says, courage is rightly esteemed the first of human qualities because it is the quality which guarantees all the rest. And that's from Winston Churchill. And he talks about you know, a story about, uh, you know, the loss of Rangers and the loss of a female Lieutenant and this courageous, you know, attributes that they have to put on their kit and step on a helicopter, you know, to, to fight the enemies of our country. But he says, it's not just soldiers. It's the courage, you know, you go talk to a doctor. It's a courage to stand up and share. It's a courage to, st- to share this story. And what I realized, you know, after, you know, 20 plus years in the military that I thought I knew what courage was because I could, I, I never feared when I was deploying that if it got to the point that I was going to end up, I was prepared. Um, I was prepared with the team that I was with. I was prepared that I was going to do whatever I can I needed to, right. To complete the mission and to bring every one of you know, the, the teammates home. And I never thought, I never was concerned about dying in combat. But what I didn't appreciate and I didn't have the appreciation for is what my wife was going through as I was going off, you know, over 60 months. And what I recognize is that every day for, you know, over 60 months and 20 plus years, She has learned, she has shown me the courage to stand by somebody, to watch them do what they're doing um, and and to fight for something which is a bigger cause than themselves. And, uh, and she did it, you know, and I didn't, I didn't see the times that she cried by herself in the shower. I didn't see the times that she had to, you know, answer the questions of why I wasn't home with my son. And I'm recognizing now that uh, those roles are reversed because uh, she's the stoic one, right? She's getting ready to go into this. And I'm realizing that this is the first time in my life that I'm, I'm now facing a different fear. And that's the fear of losing my wife. And every time that I take a step, every time that I hop in my vehicle, and I walk into that hospital, I can feel the anxiety, you know, I can feel, you know, the, the, uh, my heartbeat start to, to increase. And I know that I go back and I'm looking at, 
you know, what my wife did and she showed me the example. She showed me the example over the last 20 years about how to have the strength and courage to face your fears of losing somebody that you would love. Cause I took that for granted. And now it's my turn to show and face my fears every day by taking one step forward as we're going through that. And so, you know, when people always ask like, what is, what can we do to help and what can we do and how do we send our love? And I say, you know, my wife doesn't ask for anything and she doesn't want anybody that hears what's going on to stop what they're doing and to feel bad. She wants, you know, she appreciates all the positive vibes and prayers. But if you, what would she really love and she would really appreciate is when she hears that if you heard her story, you know, it made you hug your kids and your loved ones a little bit more. It made you pick up the phone, you know, and spend a little bit more quality time. You helped somebody out that, you know, was struggling through something. You know, you, you made a change in the lifestyle to eat more healthy for a meal or so. You ran an extra mile. And that's, that's if you come back and you, and you share that, I think that's what makes, you know, her story take life. And that's what I think her story is the fuel that she ends up, you know, likes to hear that says, if people here, I don't want them to be sad. I want them to, to know that there's, there's gratefulness in this. There's appreciation. There's love. I've, I've, I've been able to see, you know, and, and truly grateful for all the things that I have in my life, my family, the love and support of all these friends that have, you know, called multiple times, send messages, flowers, meals, but really in the end of the day, positive thoughts, vibes, prayers. And if you share the things that you've done, you know, and paid it forward, that's the thing I think that really would make an impact, you know, and makes her really feel good. And I think those are the things, you know, that, that continue to be like little deposits that will help her face, you know, what she's going to be going through on this journey. Mm-hmm.